this body telling all oh, my tongue its mystery sing and the blood all price excelling which the world's eternal king in the noble womb once dwelling shed for the world's ransoming word made flesh by word he maketh fairy bread his flesh to be man in wine Christ's blood partaketh and if senses fail to see faith alone the true heart waketh to behold the mystery our hope is he Mary's son come adore him behold the mystery St. Paul. Thanks for joining me for another brand new Bible study. We're going to be studying the Lord's Supper. Uh, Eating God's Sacrifice is the subtitle I'm working with right now. But anyway, it's a chance to dig deep into a part of our Christian life and faith that, that, that we practice every week. You know, that, that we, for many of us, we've practiced our whole lives. Holy Communion, Lord's Supper. And also, it's a part of our our life of faith and our theology that distinguishes us in a lot of ways from other Christian groups and denominations. We Lutherans, we have a very distinct and unique understanding of the Lord's Supper. I mean, obviously it's biblical, and that's what we're going to look at in this, this Bible study, but, but again, it's, what's unique about it is just how grounded our understanding of the Lord's Supper is in God's own word and nothing else. I also love a study like this because, for me, it's a chance to slow down and to really take a look at the Lord's Supper, not just from a New Testament standpoint, but but where we see it, how we see it throughout the Scriptures, starting at the very beginning of the Old Testament, how God has always worked in this very unique and very unusual way of literally feeding His people life and salvation. Sacramental eating and sacramental drinking has always been a part of the life of faith of God's people. And so we're going to look at that today, especially in our first study. But if you have any questions along the way, uh, please don't hesitate to email me uh, during the week. And I'm happy to incorporate those questions into uh, the next week's study. So today we're going to get started learning a little vocabulary. Um, there, there's two terms that I, that I think are going to be helpful for us to be able to distinguish between in our study. And the first one is the word sacrifice, okay? Not a real theological word necessarily, at least not a complicated one. Uh, sacrifice, uh, we know a common definition of that means to just give up something, right? To put your own needs aside and, and, and give someone else what they need. But, but that's actually a very Christian way of interpreting the word sacrifice, um, I, I would say probably the most basic and generic understanding of the word sacrifice would be to, to think of you know the ancient pagan religious rituals of long ago, where you know you have an animal sacrifice that's that's given to appease the gods. You know maybe some virgins are thrown into a volcano so the volcano doesn't erupt and the the fire gods don't get angry. You know that that's that's I think. Secularly speaking, in a popular sense, that's probably the, the most basic sense of the word sacrifice. You know, some kind of religious gift or offering that's made to appease the divine, appease the gods. Now, from a Christian standpoint, again, we can, we can tie into that, right? Um, our theology is all wrapped up in the fact that God gave the ultimate sacrifice, didn't he? We, we couldn't give anything to appease God, um, no animal blood, the book of Hebrews says, would ever have been enough to appease God for our sins. And so God gives the sacrifice that will, the, sheds the blood that actually will do that. Make atonement for the sins of the world. And he gives the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. 
So the word sacrifice, then, it, at least the way we're going to operate with it and use it, is, is to think about it in terms of what we give to God to try to make things right. Sacrifices are meant to make you right, um, to make up for, to make up for your, your weaknesses, your failings. So that's the word sacrifice. Now I, I want us to think about the word sacrament. Okay, now this is a very theological word. There's, you know, we don't ever use the word sacrament in um, our everyday ordinary language, our every ordinary conversations. Um, it, it's an old word. Um, the etymology, uh, you know, it comes from Latin initially. Um, as far as I know, a sacramentum was something that a Roman soldier made when he joined the Roman army. It was a pledge. He was going to pledge his time, his life, a certain number of years, um, you know, over to the emperor in service in the army. And of course, the emperor or the Romans would, would make an agreement to pay the soldier a certain amount or whatever. But, but a sacramentum was that pledge, a pledge of oneself, a pledge of, of, of giving of one's service, one's time, um, one's life, if necessary. That's sacramentum from a Latin sense, okay? I, I think the church began to use this word uh, as a way to translate the Greek word mysterion. Okay, so in the Greek... You have these certain mysteries that the scriptures talk about, ways that God works. Now, the New Testament uses this word in a couple of places, several places. Paul talks about it often, the mystery of God, um, how even the powers that be, the, the dominions and powers don't always understand why God does what he does. Why is it that he goes to such lengths to save sinners like us? It's a mystery. And a mystery is, is not, a, it's not like a murder mystery when we use that word. Um, no, a murder mystery is meant to be solved. If you figure out the clues and, and, and follow the trail, you'll figure out who done it, okay? It's a mystery that can be solved, but the Greek word mysterion means something that can't be figured out or solved. It, it's beyond us. It, it's beyond our ability to understand. And so the mysteries, you know, the, the Lord's Supper, Holy Baptism, these are mysteries. Uh, mysterion, we'll, we'll never fully understand how it is that God works through these things. Uh, how is it that God, God's word and water, how is it that God's word and wine and bread can communicate God's gifts to us? And so the, the Greek language used the word mysterion. I think when, when the church became thoroughly Latin, they started using that word sacramentum to, to, to try to understand, define, you know, and substitute for that word mysterion. Anyway, today we have the word sacrament, and the word sacrament then is specifically applied to those gifts or promises that God makes, that, that only God can make, okay? He alone does this work. It's a gift that he gives. We can't always fully understand it, but we receive it in faith, okay? A sacrament is God's gift, God's doing. And in the Lutheran Church, then, we have two sacraments, uh, at least two basic sacraments, um, and that would be the Holy Baptism and, and the Lord's Supper. Here, God is doing and God is promising. Chiefly, he's promising the forgiveness of our sins. And, and then sometimes, well, uh, Luther, the catechism sometimes hints at the idea that confession absolution is also a type of sacrament. Uh, there, God promises, too, the forgiveness of sins. And notice, in, in all three of these, really, you have a physical element being combined. Uh, water, bread and wine, and then in confession absolution, you might say it's the body of Christ itself, right? The pastor standing in the stead of Christ, announcing the forgiveness of Christ to God's people who are confessing. But, but again, a sacrament then for us as Lutherans is God, something God institutes, God promises, attaching his word to some physical element, and in the receiving of that, God's people receive a gift. And... If you think about it, in the New Testament at least, the only places where, where that happens, the only times that Jesus promises something specific, attaching it to the reception of a physical element would be in baptism and the Lord's Supper. I know the Catholic Church has seven sacraments, you know, marriage and ordination and, and all those things, but, but they're trying to define the word sacrament a little more loosely there. And uh, maybe we'll talk about that in another session. I don't want to divert our attention too much today. Um, 
But the sacrament of sacrifice, Let, let's keep the working definition in our minds. Sacrifice is something we do. A sacrament is something God does. A sacrifice is something we do to appease God, to make ourselves right. A sacrament is a gift God gives, something that we can't do, we can't understand, but in receiving it, we receive what God wants us to have. We receive what we need. All right, then finally, there, there's an adjective that I think might be useful for us to understand. Sometimes we'll talk about God working in sacramental ways. Sacramental. And, you know, we, we're not talking about Lord's Supper or baptism there. Uh, what we're talking about is God giving of his presence, making himself available or known. Um, in, in a very physical kind of way. Um, but, but not necessarily for the forgiveness of sins, like in the Lord's Supper or Holy Baptism. Um, you know, you, you could say this might be in, in when he provided manna in the wilderness. God provided this wonderful gift and, and a powerful reminder of his presence to his people. Or, or whenever Moses met with God in the tent of meeting, there would always be smoke above the tent, a visible reminder of God's presence, a sacramental reminder. God's here, God's present somehow, God's working somehow. Okay, and you're going to see that all through the Old Testament, God working in sacramental ways. Okay, enough vocabulary for today, okay? I want to get to something a little bit more, you know, Bible study-esque. Let's get into God's Word. So my first question for you is, as we explore the Lord's Supper, my first question is, where would you, where would you say is the very first instance of God working in a sacramental way, through eating, no less, in the Old Testament? God giving of himself through eating, sacramentally giving of himself through eating in the Old Testament. Well, I'll give you the answer because obviously we're doing this via video, but you have to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. In fact, the, the first three chapters of Genesis to, to find the answer. If you'll remember, if you turn to Genesis chapter 2, um, we get um, a account of creation from a little different perspective, right? Genesis chapter one gives us the, the six days of creation. God rests on the seventh day. We're told how God made man in his image. He made them male and female, but we're not given a lot of details uh, about mankind. Uh, chapter two shows us that up close, okay? What exactly was it like on day six when God created man? We learn that he shaped Adam out of the dust of the earth and then plants this beautiful garden uh, full of fruit trees, and Adam it will have more than enough food uh, and, and provisions uh, to provide for him. And then in the very center of the garden, what we hear is that in verse 9 of chapter 2, we hear that, And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant in the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, God plants all of these fruit trees that are to be food for Adam. And in the midst of the garden, he puts two very special trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, if you skip down a little bit, God commands man concerning these trees. He says in verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So Adam is to eat of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which means that one tree that he is commanded to eat from is what? The tree of life. There is the tree of life in the midst of the garden, in the most special place in the garden, and Adam and Eve are to eat of this tree regularly, often daily. The one tree that they are to not eat from, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, now, I think we're all probably familiar enough with our Bibles to know that Adam and Eve, you know, every day are going to the center of the garden and they're there eating of the tree of life, but one day, lo and behold, they get caught up in a conversation over at the other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan shows up disguised as a serpent, disguised as part of God's good creation, and there entices Adam and Eve to eat of this other tree. But we're not even going to go down that path right now. Just 
just again, let's, let's contemplate the fact that God creates, of all the things that God could have created, of all the ways that God could have designed creation and, and the relationship between him and mankind, how does God set things up? He sets things up so that Adam and Eve every day would get to eat, get to eat of life and salvation. You know, God is the author of life, so literally they're feeding upon God himself. Every day they'd get God's presence, not just to see it or to hear it or to feel it, but to consume it. Now, why do you think, why, why is it that God would make himself available in a way that, that his people could eat, you know, eat of eternal life and salvation? I've often wondered that myself. And the only answer I can think of is the fact that God made us to be physical creatures, physical creatures that had to eat, right? Adam and Eve are going to, you know, maintain their health, maintain themselves, maintain their life through eating. Biologically, they have to stay alive through eating. And so it is then that God makes Adam and Eve's spiritual life also dependent on eating. Now, I don't think it's that that's, this was the only way. I think it's because this is the way that God knew that Adam and Eve could understand it best. I mean, all of us, we understand the craving, the hunger that we feel when, when we, you know, gone all day and maybe haven't had lunch and it's been a busy day and, and we're starving. Oh, you know, you suddenly start conjuring up pictures of, of food in your mind. And sometimes it's the strangest things. Like when I'm super hungry and, I, you know, I, I didn't eat much for breakfast and skipped lunch at work and, and now it's the late in the afternoon and, oh, sometimes I'll, all of a sudden I'll remember like, oh, wow, you know, there's, there's a piece of, you know, bacon left in the fridge from breakfast. I remember putting it in there or... Or boy, I just I need some a banana and peanut butter. You know, and all of a sudden that 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 in your mind tastes better than anything ever could. You know, and you hang on that image, and then of course sometimes it's so disappointing when I come home and realize the kids ate all the bananas, and so you know now I don't get my bananas and peanut butter that I was craving all day. That craving, that hunger. That's a part of being human, and God. God tied that into his relationship with mankind, giving us the ability to literally eat, feed upon his grace and his love and his mercy and life itself. Um, every morning, Adam and Eve would get to wake up and, and gather there at the tree in the middle of the garden and partake of God's goodness, partake of life, partake of what they needed to sustain them. If only we could hunger in that way crave the good things of God. Um, I always tell my compromands that, you know, when it comes to preparing for Holy Communion, you know, our, our minds, our physical mind, Satan, our, our sinful flesh is always going to tell us, eh, you know, we can go another week without communion. We don't need it. You know, what, what is it? Just a bite of bread and wine, you know, who cares? We got more important things on our plate to worry about. But I said, part of cultivating a Christian life is reminding ourselves of of what we truly need to, to be spiritually healthy. We need to eat the right sort of things. Um, and the Lord's Supper is a part of that, the most important part of that, that we, we should cultivate a craving, a hunger each week for the things of God, for, for his gifts and the sacrament. Looking forward to Sunday morning, you know, thinking back on our week and our day and all the ways that we've sinned and, and looking forward then to that day when God will bring us into his house and we can receive God's gift of forgiveness and life and salvation. Get to literally consume it so that there can be no doubt whatsoever. It wasn't a matter of whether I focused hard enough and listened to the sermon and, and really paid attention during the prayers. No, it's not dependent on me. It's dependent on God. His word puts it in my hands and I get to eat it, and I get to walk away from that altar rail knowing that I've received what I truly need. You know, just like after you take your vitamins, you know you've received what you need, okay? You got it taken care of. We get to partake of Jesus Christ. And then we get to go and, and approach a whole nother week knowing that we have what we truly need. That's good. I mean, that's really good. We get to start our week every week just like that, just like Adam and Eve got to start their day in the Garden of Eden, partaking of God's goodness. All right, guys, well, we're going to leave it at that today, and I'll pick up uh, in session two 
talking about how God continues this theme of feeding his people, literally feeding them life and salvation, feeding them of, of his own presence, okay, feeding them of himself. Uh, I hope you have an awesome rest of your day. Whatever you're doing this day, whatever day of the week it is, let's look forward to Sunday together. Okay, let's look forward to get to gather up there at that altar and partake of the Lord's goodness, getting to eat of Jesus Christ. I hope you have a good one. We'll see you next time. Therefore we before him bending this great sacrament revere Types and shadows have their ending for the new right is here Faith are ours it's befriending makes the inward vision clear Our hope is here Mary son come adore him Behold Sacrament